Good morning, church. It's uh, so good for you to see you this morning. We want to welcome you uh, just one more time here to Petra. We are so grateful uh, that you are here. We believe that God is going to speak powerfully this morning as we get into uh, the content. We have just had a, a wonderful series of meeting the Father and allowing him to come and to forgive and to cleanse and heal. Has anyone been blessed by this series so far as you've been pressing in? Amen. We are so grateful uh, for what God is doing in our community, and, and, and this morning is an important morning uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, not just because of uh, the content, but because of what it says about God and what it says about who we are uh, as people and as a church. Uh, in the New Testament, there's a story of a young man who makes a series of really poor decisions, and the Bible says that there's a moment when he comes to his senses. Uh, he realizes the situation that he's in, and you know, he makes a very interesting decision in that moment he makes a decision to run back to his father. That's a very, that's a very powerful decision. Uh, to know that the father would accept him, to know that the father would love him, despite all of his sin and all of his shame, he makes the decision to run back to the father. And we find that the, the young man, as he approaches his home, uh, he's not the one doing the running. The father is. His father is chasing after him. And, and this is important for us as individuals because one of the things that we want to teach here at Petra is that there is a loving father who wants to forgive you. He, he cares for you. Uh, but this is more important because Petra, we want to be a place as a church where people can come to and meet that father. Amen? We want to be a place where people can come uh, with their shame and come with their sin and come with their struggle and meet this loving father, a place of grace and a place of mercy a place where you can find healing. And I'm so grateful this morning that we get to talk about such a sensitive topic, such an important topic in our current culture, and that we get to be a part of what God is doing, not just in our church, but also in our community to bring healing. Would you pay attention to the screens here for just a few moments? We want to highlight some of the ministry that takes place here at Petra Church. One of our Life Spring Healing Ministries here at Petra is Pure Desire. Founded by Dr. Ted and Diane Roberts, who recognize the pervasiveness of sexual struggle in the church. Over the course of two decades, they developed a strategy that is biblically based, clinically informed, and highly successful in creating lasting change and breaking the isolation and shame cycle. We have several recovery groups for men and women healing from sexual addiction and the betrayal that goes with it. For men, we offer Conquer Series, Seven Pillars, Warpath, and Helping Her Heal. For women, there are Betrayal and Beyond and Unraveled groups. We'll be launching a new group this spring, Sexual Integrity 101. Watch for more details coming with our spring small groups. This eight-week video training and small group study is designed for men, women, students, pastors, lay leaders, parents, and others who want to find freedom from the effects of unwanted sexual behaviors or gaining understanding about addictions and betrayal trauma. It helps. It has provided a safe place for me to learn, to grow, and to be able to talk about things I've never been able to talk about before. It has provided direction in processing all that was being discovered how to forgive myself and others and go forward without slipping back into old patterns. I learned to take off the mask and do a new dance. Transformed. Pure Desire has been a vehicle for incredible change. My brain is being remolded by Jesus as behavior, lies, and strongholds have been changed. And Pure Desire has been one of the key ministries here at Petra where small groups, materials, podcasts have been instruments to show me Jesus in real, active, and powerful ways to transform my marriage and my overall life. This was just a piece of my overall healing journey. I feel Unraveled is like an AA support group for love addicts. I was able to pioneer with other courageous women who were willing to look at themselves and share vulnerable areas of struggle that either destroyed their relationships or at best were only surviving. Being known and accepted by other sisters created a safe place where I was able to do the hard work 
of changing lifelong habits of seeking my value and worth from others or what I did for them. Most importantly, these women challenged me weekly to grow in my self-care and the things I was struggling with. Their encouragement, along with accountability, empowered me to celebrate many victories with them, which made all the hard work worth it. Oh my, I've had a front row seat in watching transformation of my husband. The loving hand of God broke both of us and is reshaping us. Maybe you were like me when considering this group. Because you don't struggle or relate to unwanted sexual behaviors, this group isn't for me. But I don't know a woman out there living in our culture that doesn't struggle with her identity and security in Christ from time to time. The statistics are staggering, and we are responsible to do everything we can to model to the next generation, not just living the Christian life, but an intimate, growing relationship with Jesus. And out of this abundance, pour out his love to others. You cannot do this without experiencing it yourself. Do not be afraid of an unraveled group. God will do amazing things in you and through you. I'm so glad I did. Well, I am now able to be true. I can live in the freedom of the truth, no more lies. So that has allowed Lou Ann and I to learn to respond to one another, to learn to be sensitive to her, and listen to her with a different level of hearing. Healing in His Spirit is so glorious. I'm growing in love and sensitivity to my wife. And with the help of Pure Desire resources, I'm coming alongside other brothers who need a hand and am being used as a tool for the Lord to provide healing and restoration. That is a healing balm to my soul in recovery and redemption. I personally feel like I'm still healing, but God has given me a passion to encourage other women who are in a similar place as I was, and I'm so thankful to have the resources to direct them to help, healing, and hope. Honestly, the fact that we are where we are today is truly a miracle, and it's all because of Jesus. Amen. There's been some uh, incredible ministry taking place at our church. I'm excited to get into the content this morning and introduce to you the executive director of Pure Desire Ministry. This is Nick Stumbo. I want to give you as much time as possible. It's a real honor uh, to have you here. So share your heart, brother. We're so grateful that you're here this morning. Let's welcome uh, Nick to the stage this morning. Thank you, Pastor Brian, and good morning, church. It is great to be with you today. I uh, come to you from uh, Portland, Oregon, where my wife and I live. Please don't judge us. We think it's weird, too. <sighs> but we love our city, and we pray for our city because it is a place that needs the love and hope of Jesus Christ, just as we all do. Uh, my wife and I have four kids, and it was a couple of weeks ago I was laying in our uh, bed in our bedroom when my 12-year-old son came running in, and he said, Dad, come quick. Mom needs you. There's water everywhere. Those are not the words you want to hear from any of your kids. And so I jumped out of bed and ran down the hallway to the little half bath we have, and sure enough, the toilet was just overflowing at a very alarming rate. And there was already an inch or two of water on the floor in the half bath that was now seeping out of the doorway into the rest of the house. And my wife, with a, a very panicked look, said on her face, should I turn the water off? And I said, of course, why didn't you do that already? And so she reaches down and turns off the valve and we get like every f towel we can find in the house and begin sopping up the water. And it is truly amazing how quickly a little bit of water in the wrong place can become a major problem. Have you ever noticed that? That there are many forces or desires that when channeled in the right way are incredibly healthy. The, the water that is within our pipes keeps our home sanitary. But that same water running across the floor creates incredible panic. Water inside the banks of a river is a tremendous resource in our world for natural life, transportation methods of people and cargo, and the energy that's powering dams around the world. 
But that same water overflowing its banks is one of the most destructive forces known to mankind. A semi-truck that is barreling down the freeway at 70 miles an hour is how I get my Amazon Prime packages in two days or less, all with free shipping. Anybody else? But that same semi-truck barreling through a shopping mall or a park would be a terrifying, terrifying thing. The spinning of wind and air through a jet engine, a turbine, or an airplane can give them lift and create renewable energy in our world. But spinning wind in places like Kansas and Oklahoma has been feared since the earliest days of American settlement down in Tornado Alley. You see, the force or the element itself is not the problem. It is the context or the way in which that force and element is being used that can either be very good or very destructive. And so it is with our desires. They can either be healthy or unhealthy. The desire in and of itself is really not the problem. And in particular today, we want to address our sexual desires. Because understood and used within the right purposes, they can be incredibly healthy. Our pure desires can be the glue of a marriage relationship or, if we're single, the motive for good relational decisions about our future. But misunderstood and improperly directed, out-of-control sexual desire has ruined marriages, wasted fortunes, toppled careers, and wrecked more lives than we could care to count. The data that we have found and been able to use through Pure Desire Ministries is compelling. It would suggest that 65% of men in the church and 30% of women are struggling with some kind of unwanted sexual behavior. That they would say, this keeps happening in my life in spite of my best efforts to be done with it. 50% of pastors would say the same thing. 64% of our young adults say that viewing pornography is something that happens on a weekly basis. A secular law firm did research a few years ago and found that of the divorces happening in our country, 56% of them involve the obsessive activity of one of the partners online as a driving factor in the divorce. So pornography and affairs happening online are a major cause of divorces today. We know the stats that things like sexual abuse and sex trafficking are skyrocketing around the world. The reality this morning is that you and I, there's not a person in this room that hasn't been impacted in some way by out of control sexual desires, whether in our own lives and choices or in the lives of someone we love and care about. Our world is being overrun because of sexual desire which can lead us to a place perhaps where we fear sexual desire or we think of it as wrong or something that that really should just be kept at arm's length. But the truth that we want to look at this morning is how our God is the author of our sexuality. And if we can come to him and understand in a new way what sexual desire is about and what it's intended for, that it can be channeled in a way that not only honors God but creates in us the kind of life that we have longed to live. See, the truth is this morning that I know the reality of -of out-of-control sexual desires. I grew up in a good and godly home, but at a young age, about 10 or 11 years old, I was exposed to pornography at a friend's house. And there were two things that took place in me that evening. One was a, a push away of, this feels wrong, I don't really want to see this. My parents would probably be very angry if they knew I'd seen it, and so I better not tell them. But at the same time, a pull that said, wow, something in my brain can't wait to see more. And in that push-pull created an incredible amount of shame about what I had seen. And so in that shame, I began to process my sexual desires on my own, trying to figure out how I handle this thing that just seemed to be way, way bigger than I was. And so as I aged in my teenage years, that desire morphed into magazines and online pornography. All along the way, though, I was committed to following Christ. In fact, I went to Bible college and trained to be a pastor. And and even in the midst of the Bible college years and training to be a pastor were some of my worst seasons of struggling with pornography. And in my life, every time was going to be the last time. It would happen again and I would come before the Lord and just pour out my heart and repentance and God, I'm I'm so sorry this isn't the man I want to be. And this is the last time, I promise. 
And I'd been, been trained well by the church that when you had any kind of issue in your life that wouldn't go away, that what you needed to do was James chapter 5. You needed to confess your sins one to another and you would be healed. And I desperately wanted healing. And so I confessed to my, my youth pastor and then the dorm floor leader at my Bible college and the, the dean of students and my first senior pastor and even my elder board just saying, this is something that happened and I'm sorry and I'm working on it. Would you forgive me? You know, those, those times of confession were always incredible because by God's mercy, I was always in the room with people of incredible grace. They would speak of Christ's love over me and his forgiveness and they would send me on my way to go and sin no more. Only nobody knew what to do other than to say, Nick, try harder and pray more not to fall into the sin. And I would try hard and I would pray more and yet it would seem in spite of my best efforts, those out of control desires would sooner or later lead me back into yet another struggle. I became a senior pastor at the ripe age of 26. And at that time, then, the only safe person left to confess to was my wife, who had known about my struggles in our dating years. I'd been honest with her, and uh, she'd asked me, well, why don't you just promise that you'll never do it again? And I remember in our engagement saying to her, I'll, I'll do my best, but it seems like no matter how hard I try, it keeps coming back. And it had throughout our marriage continued to come back. And so my repeated confessions to her that were happening a few times a year or a few times every other month, I would come and say, it's still happening, I'm sorry, but, but I promise this is going to be the, the last time. And after 10 years in our marriage of telling my wife it was going to be the last time, she had truly had enough. We had come to a breaking point where my out-of-control sexual desires, though our life in so many other ways was wonderful, we had a growing church and healthy children, and in most ways a very good marriage, and yet I couldn't seem to handle the one thing that was undermining all of it. And in 2010, 11 years ago, she was ready to walk away because of the pain that it was continuing to cause her. And it was at that time, by God's mercy, that we were introduced to Pure Desire Ministries. And for the first time in my life, I was introduced to a process and to pastors that understood something more than pray more and try harder, but understood how the human heart works, how God designed the human brain, and how sin and Satan hijacked the good systems God designed in our brain and had used them to hook me into evil purposes. I got involved in a weekly group for men who were struggling and my wife got into a group for wives who had been betrayed. And as we began to walk through this process, God did something new and beautiful in our lives. I was with a group of men, a group of peers that had never seen me preach or lead or do anything good. All they knew about me was the worst of my life, my sin and my brokenness. And in spite of that, I found a group of men that loved and accepted me. And in their love and acceptance, I think for the first time I understood the love and acceptance that Jesus had for me. Not in the good parts of me where I performed well and did the right things, but the love he had for me in my sin, my brokenness, and my shame. And over the course of that year, our lives, my life, and our marriage were truly and deeply transformed. As I met Jesus in places in my life where I didn't know how to introduce him. And it created a purifying and a change in my desires that then became part of the story that we were able to share with our church and our community. A, a story that I like to relate to people is that a couple years into that, as we began Pure Desire groups at our church, I heard from someone who uh, was visiting our church one weekend that I had become known in our small town, our small city, as the porn pastor. I wasn't entirely sure how I felt about that. But what I thought about was this, that if that means someone hears that that's a church you can go to and be real about your struggles with pornography or sexuality or anything else, then I would take the title because I knew that we needed safe places for men and for women who were struggling. And Petra Church, I believe, is becoming and has become that kind of a place where it is safe to deal with our stuff because God has a way of bringing healing it's just that for so many of us in simply trying harder and praying more, we haven't found the kind of healing or the ways of introducing Jesus into our struggle that we really and truly need. And so that's why this morning I really want to dive into the word of God and see what does it look like for him to purify our sexual desires? How could we take something, whether in our own life or for those that we love, our children or our spouse is someone that we know that's struggling, how can we help find the way towards the purifying of our desires? 
And I really believe we get some incredible insights this morning from the book of Romans, a place that we might not think to turn to because the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter to the church in Rome doesn't say a lot specifically about sex and sexuality. And yet through the grid of sexuality, his words I think are incredibly important for you and I to understand what does it look like to purify our desires. So if you uh, brought a Bible this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 11. We're going to be looking at the very end of Romans 11 and then go into Romans chapter 12 as well. And at the end of some of uh, Paul's deepest and most thoughtful theology, these are the words we read in Romans 11 verses 33 to 36. He says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Think about that last verse with me for a moment if you will. For from him and through him and for him are all things. Paul is saying that the greatness of our God is so beyond measure that everything that we see and experience in this world in some way has come from and through God and is intended for his purposes and in his glory. You know, one of the things I had the opportunity to do is not only go to Bible college, but also to seminary. And if, if any of you have, have ever walked that path, you know that you get to take a lot of the original Greek language. Uh, the, the language that is most closely to what it would have originally been authored in. And, and in the Greek, if you look up this verse, that word for all things, do you know what the, the original language of all things says there in the Greek? It says all things. Yes, you too could learn biblical Greek. It is that good. But I want to emphasize this point that it, it's saying, Paul is saying everything comes from our God and through our God and is intended for his glory. And if it is all things, that includes your sexuality and mine. That God is the author of our sexuality. See, one of the things I believe that we really struggle with when we start to talk about sex and things related to it, there's, there can be so many negative stories, so many things that feel very carnal and earthly and wrong even or sinful and we might convince ourselves that God is somehow distant from sex. That over here is God and over here is my sexuality and the two are never to meet. And so when we come to God with our sexuality for us, there can be this awkwardness of like, well, I don't really know what to say and this feels weird and God, you probably don't understand and, and the truth is nothing could be further from the truth. That God made your sexuality. God understands how it works. He's the author of it. And so the starting point for any conversation about sexual purity and how it's going to work out in our lives is to start here with this idea to recognize that our sexuality comes from a good God. That our sexuality comes from a good God. That his plans for us to be sexual beings is a good plan. And that every man, woman, and child born into this world is a sexual being. Genesis chapter 1 says that in his image, God created them male and female. He created them in his image. And it repeats the in his image phrase so that we recognize who we are in our gender distinctions, which if you think about it, is primarily a sexual distinction, right? Related to body parts and brain chemistry and hormones. That's what makes us male and female. God looked at that and said, that's where I see my image. In the uniqueness of you being a male, in the uniqueness of you being a female, that's my image printed into your humanity. And so rather than feeling like we're, we're in the wrong place when we talk about anything sexual, we need to realize this is the gift from God first and foremost, and we want to rediscover the gift that he's given to us. And so God made in Genesis 3 Adam and Eve to be sexual beings. And, and when they began to enjoy the physical intimacy of being sexual together, you know, God didn't look down and go, oh my goodness, what are they doing? What? Stop that. Don't touch. Get off of her. No. No. God looked at Adam and Eve and he blessed their sexuality. But their sexuality also was then impacted by the fallenness. That when they chose to sin and chose to break away from the way of God, that sinfulness entered into our sexuality and has twisted it towards things that God did not intend. 
And that's why we want to look at how do we purify our desires because at the core of it is a good blessing that God has bestowed on humanity. And as the author of our sexuality, we want to come before him boldly to say, Lord, help me to understand the goodness of your plan in my body, in my desires, and in the way I use it. So Paul goes on immediately after these verses and remember that in the New Testament, as Paul wrote, he didn't write chapter headings. You you recognize that, right? He didn't go Romans chapter 12, new heading, a living sacrifice. No, Paul would have gone right from one sentence into the next. So in 12.1, his very next thought is to say this, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So here Paul is saying that in light of a God who is great beyond our ability to even fathom it or imagine it, and who is the author of all things that come through him and are by him and are for him, in light of that, here's how we respond. He says, we come and we offer our bodies as a sacrifice to him. Now, if if this passage wasn't connected to what Paul has just said about the greatness and the goodness of God, this verse wouldn't make a lot of sense. It would seem arbitrary. It would seem like we have this God that demands of us our lives and, and we've got to come and sacrifice something in a negative way. But Paul is saying, therefore... In in light of who God is, the best thing you can do with your life and your body is to bring it to him and say, God, this life is yours. And, And think for a moment about the first century readers of this letter. When they heard that word sacrifice, You see, for us, it's kind of a metaphorical idea of of maybe giving of myself or sacrificing some time or energy. But for the first century reader, sacrifice was a very visible, visceral kind of thing. They would have been able to imagine what they had seen with their own eyes of people choosing a perfect animal from their herd and bringing that to the temple to lay on the altar for the priest to take and slaughter that animal for its blood to run across the the altar and to purify them and their family for any sins they had committed. So when they think sacrifice, it's not just this nostalgic idea. It It is an offering of a life and then stepping back and saying, though I could choose to use this for myself and for my family, instead, I'm bringing it to God in honor of him and I am stepping back and taking my hands off and saying, Lord, it's yours. Use it however you want. That's the image that Paul gives us of bringing our bodies to God. That though we could choose to use it for our own selfish pleasures, though we could choose to use it just to run after what feels good or makes sense to us, that instead we bring our life to God and say, it's yours My hands are off. This is a decision that we must make when it comes to our sexuality. And the note is this, if you're following along using the notes and the blanks, here's the note, that we have to decide who's calling the shots. We have to decide who's calling the shots. This is so important in the area of our sexuality because we get a lot of other ideas coming to us from culture or others or or Hollywood and movies that say, no, this is how you should use your body. And if we're not allowing our hands to come off and say, God, it's yours, we will be pulled into some of those different ways of thinking and sexuality as God designed it won't make a whole lot of sense. So we've got to be willing to say, God, it's yours. You get to call the shots in my life. And what you say, I will do. So what what does that look like? Well, Paul goes on and says this in verse 2, kind of, I think, unpacking. What does it look like for you and I to offer our bodies to God, to say, Lord, it's yours? He says this, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, God has a will for our sexuality that is good, is pleasing, and is perfect. But we will never get to that. We will never understand it unless we first make these decisions to offer our body to God and then follow the first half of verse 2. That it's the ability to see God's good, pleasing, and perfect will is contingent on our willingness to enter into the first half of the verse, which is first where he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. 
And the, the word there in the Greek for conform very much would have brought up a word picture for the first century audience that would have thought about a kind of mold that is used to pour in hot wax or um, moldable clay that then could be pressed down and shaped into an image, maybe a, a utensil or an idol that they would have worshipped uh, in that first century time. And, and as something was pressed in, it would take on the shape of the mold that it was in. And so what Paul is saying here is that we, in the same way, we are being pressed to conform to a mold of our culture and to look and act and think as they do. And so if we're ever going to get to this place where we discover God's good, perfect, and pleasing will, we must be willing to expose what is the mold that culture tries to press us into. So how do, that's the third point, is that we must avoid the mold of culture. We must avoid being pressed into the mold of our culture because the culture is preaching lies to us that we are tempted to believe when it comes to our sexuality. And like so many lies, the reasons these are powerful is because there's a part of it that sounds good, that sounds true. And so I've been thinking through like in our culture today, in, in the year 2021, what are the kind of lies that our culture believes when it comes to sex and sexuality. And I have found seven that I think are primarily driving the thinking and behaving of so many people today. The first lie that we might be tempted to believe is that our sex equals our identity. That sex or the amount of sex we're having or the amount of my sexual appeal is what gives me my identity. The truth is that your identity is far, far greater than the amount of sex you're having or your sexual appeal to other people. And our sex is far insufficient to be worthy of grounding our identity or our sense of value within. God gave you identity, value, and belonging far greater than anything to do with whether or not you're sexually active with others. But I call this the James Bond effect. That for many of us, we watch what happens in movies in Hollywood and think, well, that's what it means to have value and identity and worth. Someone that is just debonair and attractive and always getting the girls. And yet it's a lie that says that's not where value comes from. The second lie I think that we're tempted to believe says I can't help what I feel. That, that what I feel, well, it's just natural. And, and these things are just within me. And if it's natural, well, then I, I just have to do what my desires tell me to do. When the truth is that what we feel, our desires are actually a unique combination of both our nature and our nurture. That our family of origin, the home we grew up in, the context of our upbringing, the culture that we grew up around, the experiences that we have had, both things done to us and by us, have deeply shaped and influenced our brain in a way that leads to certain desires. And the good news here is that if our desires have been shaped, they can be reshaped. Science is showing us over and over that our brain is not fixed, as many people believe for hundreds of years, but our brain is actually quite moldable and that it gravitates in the direction that we send it. And so our experiences and our past and often our pain and our wounds are driving us into desires that we haven't learned to question because we think of them as natural and yet they've been shaped. And friends, God's design is to help you reshape your brain so that your desires flow towards him and the good gift of sexuality that he wants for you and I. The third lie that I think we're tempted to believe is that, well, everyone does it. Oh, all guys do this. Boys will be boys. Uh, people just, you know, it's, it's part of the culture now. Everyone's doing it. Could we just be honest for a moment? This excuse didn't work with mom in the seventh grade. We shouldn't still be using it now as adults. Okay, are you hearing me? Right, like you'd go to mom in the seventh grade, well, everyone's going to that party. And what would your mom say? Well, if all your friends jumped off a cliff, would you do it too? Right, how many heard that? How many then used that as a parent? Yes, that's me. Like, I thought it was a great line when my mom used it, so I've used it many times. But, but that's the truth, right? Just because we feel or perceive that everyone's doing it doesn't necessarily make it good, healthy, or right. And I believe it's a trap of the enemy that tries to say, well, if you don't, you'll be the only one. You'll be alone. No one will understand you. And friends, that's a lie we must reject. The fourth lie we're tempted to believe is that, well, I will always struggle. This is just the way it's going to be. It's my cross to bear. It's the thorn in my flesh. It's, it's just not something you can help. 
And friends, that's what I'm so excited to be able to share about as we go into Pure Desire conferences and events is that freedom is possible. That there is a transformation that Christ has for us that involves maybe a deeper process than we anticipated. That we've got to get into that deeper stuff of what's driving me, what's created these patterns, and unraveling them may take time and more effort than we expected, but freedom and lasting change is possible. And so we must reject the lie that says, well, I'm just always going to struggle. You can be free. The people you care about can be free. The fifth lie that we must be willing to confront is the lie that says, well, I must have a sexual outlet. Having a sexual outlet has become synonymous with just a basic human need and we can feel like, well, I I just have this need and so who am I to deny my basic needs? And yet as one of my good friends and counselors at Pure Desire Ministries has often said, if you don't have sex, you won't die. It's true. Did you know that? If you don't have sex, you won't die. And we need to be able to, in our brains, realize this is not a need. This is something I can learn to handle whether or not I am married or have that sexual outlet. The sixth lie that we're tempted to believe is that no one is being hurt. Ah, it's no big deal. It's just pictures on a screen. No, No one's really being hurt. And yet if we were honest, if we could go around this room, and we won't, so take a deep breath, But if we could go around this room and share our deepest hurts, many of them are sexual in nature. The abuse we suffered as a child, a broken relationship in our family or our own life, body image issues, bullying, things we experienced. Our sexual brokenness is uniquely painful and we are deeply hurt by the out-of-control desires of our own lives and others around us. And maybe we'd be able to even just pause and say, even if no one else is being hurt, I'm being hurt because it's hurting my ability to have good, healthy, honest, vulnerable relationships with other people. It's hurting me. And so we can reject the lie that says no one is being hurt. And then finally, the lie that we must reject in our culture is a lie that says more sex equals more life. That those that are having the greatest and most frequent sex are those that also have the greatest life. And if you're not having great sex, then you're missing out on the pinnacle of life. Friends, that's a lie that our culture wants us to believe. More sex does not equal more life. In fact, we could flip it around that, that as we're walking in the fullness of the life that God intends for us within healthy marriage relationships, that's actually what leads to more sex, not the other way around. So as we learn to reject and confront these lies, then we can go on to the second part of this verse where Paul said, do not be conformed by the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Recognize here the the distinct order of the wording, that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. You see, I think if we haven't really thought about it, we believe that that when we're transformed, when God just kind of comes and does this miraculous work of transforming us, then we'll have a renewed mind, which is a beautiful idea, and I wish God did it that way, just snapped his fingers and set us free, but, but I believe he has work he wants us to do so that we learn and discover more about ourselves and more about him. And so the ordering of it, Paul says, as you renew your mind, as you learn to think differently over time, you will be transformed. So we're to be transformed by thinking differently over time. This is a process that takes time, brain renewal and relearning these patterns and unraveling where they've all come from can be a two to five year process of creating that new normal so much so that we don't want to go back to the old one that we used to live in. And when I say that kind of time frame, people are like, well, I don't have that much time. I just, I can't invest in that, which I like to say, well, where will you be two to five years from now if you don't invest in this? Would you like to sit in this room two years from now and say, yeah, I'm still in the same place? Isn't something in us saying, I'm, I'm ready to be done with this and whatever it takes, if it's that investment of time, I'm in. See, the, the truth is this morning that we can purify our sexual desires when we see that pure desires spring from a purposeful heart. Pure desires come out of a heart that has been purposed to to see God's goodness in our sexuality, to agree with the goodness of God's plan and offer him our bodies to say, it's not to be used my way, Lord, but yours. Show me how to use it. 
a heart that is avoiding the mold of our culture and that is daily being renewed so that we're transformed. That is a purposeful heart where our desires flow in the direction God designed them to flow in. So many people perhaps end here because Romans 12, 1 and 2 is so well known. It feels like, well, let's just end the passage. But I think it's interesting what Paul goes on to say next because I think there's a connection here. Look at Romans 12, 3 through 5 with me. He says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. I think it is no coincidence that Paul goes from talking about a renewed mind and a transformed life to immediately talking about our need for community. The need that we have for one another, that we belong to a body and we're members of it and the body needs us just as we need them. And he speaks of an arrogance or a pride that would say, no, I don't need other people. I can do this by myself. Which interestingly, friends, is the very thing that keeps so many people trapped in their sexual brokenness is we hear a message and we think, yes, okay, I'm going to go home and I'm going to try harder and pray more to fix this problem, only the problem is we're still doing it by ourselves. And in isolation, there is no freedom. It is in community and engaging with the people of God that we're able to find these pathways into a new way of thinking and behaving because we were made for one another. And so if we want to see lasting change and freedom, we must take this application step, which is to humble ourselves to community. To humble ourselves to community, to recognize this isn't just a me problem, this is an us problem. And we need to learn and grow and change together. And that's one of the things we try to invite churches into through Pure Desires to say this isn't just something needed by a few select people, right? Those people that have that problem, they need that group. Now, this is an area we all need to be trained, equipped, and discipled to think and behave in a way that is biblical and honoring to God. And that's one of the things that all of you can learn through the class coming up that Pastor Brian mentioned called Sexual Integrity 101, and it was on the video. And I want to have you see just a short video about what the Sexual Integrity 101 video series is all about. So watch the screens for this introduction of SI 101. True healing and freedom from the effects of unwanted sexual behavior is possible. But for so many, the path has been littered with failed attempts, short-term solutions that don't work, and tons of shame carried the entire way. I knew Jesus was calling me into the light because it's better in the light. However, I was afraid of the people that were out there in the light. If you're battling something like an addiction to pornography and you don't confess that to another person, you don't confess it to the Lord, then shame grows. So many of us live lives running from our shame. We, we don't turn and face those things. There are men and women sitting in our churches that have pain and secrets and they feel like they can't tell anybody. We know the feeling of powerlessness that sets in when you promised you'd never go back to that old behavior, but you found yourself there again. That's it. I, finally, I did it. It's, it's gone. Only to go back to it. It didn't last long. I was binge purging between being at church three times a week and serving on the women's team and the worship team and then going out on weekends and hooking up with somebody. I would experience seasons of relative freedom, maybe three or four months at a time without acting out. But even though we had a great relationship, both physically and emotionally, I would find myself stumbling back into the same predictable pattern. We know the feelings of betrayal and hopelessness that overpowers our ability to function day to day. Because of the trauma that I was experiencing in my first marriage, my brain was grasping for any amount of control that it could have because of the lies that I was believing. I was so much in pain, I just wanted him away from me. I was just mostly in shock. People would say, are you sure you're trusting? Are you sure you're praying? It would make me frustrated. But we believe that this course is the first step toward breaking free and finally feeling hope and confidence that change is possible. And that's why we're so excited about this course. When you really get under the surface of our sexual issues, we find that we are all so similar as human beings. So no matter what your personal struggle is or what brought you here, I believe this journey together will be life-changing. Because if we want to find lifelong healing, it's going to take an understanding of both 
It's going to take an understanding of what's happening in our brain that contributes to our behavior, but also the fact that we need the Holy Spirit in our lives that is going to be active in our healing. Why well, stops? and started to experience sobriety and freedom, then the truth of who God sees me as his loved son who he delights in, no matter what, started to be able to sink in. This course will combine biblical truth with practical tools to create lifelong change. It's not just about trying harder to stop unwanted behavior. It's about being intentional, going to the source of struggles and allowing the Lord to heal them. We know this because each of us in this course has experienced this firsthand. And we've seen hundreds of thousands of other men and women break free, heal their relationships, and really get their lives back. Amen. There's some good looking speakers in that video series. I'm glad I didn't wear the same shirt as in the video. That would have been awkward. Uh, if you'd like to know more about Pure Desire Ministries, uh, after the service, my colleague and I, Rich Moore, who is with me, our men's groups coordinator, will be at a Pure Desire book table, and uh, you can check out the resources. If you're watching online, we want you to have that same ability to check out Pure Desire more. You could go to our website and to our store there, and this week, you can get free shipping on any resources you want to check out to begin, perhaps, your healing journey or to help someone that you love. So we'd love to meet you there afterwards. Friends, I look back at where I was uh, about 11 years ago today, sitting in a room somewhat like this, hearing about an opportunity to find help through pure desire. And as broken as I was, as messed up as I was in my thinking, what is so scary to me is I was also in a huge fog of denial, rationalization, and minimization. Because as I heard about the hope and freedom that was available, something in me said, I don't need that. I can do this by myself because I wanted to stay in the safety of being the only one who knew how messy my life was. But I look back and shudder to think what my life would have become had I stayed in that place because my sin was destroying me. And it wasn't until we walked into a safe environment with people who knew a better way that God began to new, do a new work. And it saved my marriage, it saved my family, it saved our ministry. And I truly believe, had it not been for that, I was on a course to be out of marriage and out of ministry. You know, after our healing journey, we had our fourth son, our fourth child. And I've thought often as I see him, and I mean, he's just full of energy and joy. And, you know, you don't have favorite kids, but I kind of have a favorite kid. Partly because I look at him and say, but by the grace of God, we would not have been together to have you. And he's our gift to us, our Luke because there was healing that came into our family. And friends, many of you perhaps are in places like that where there is brokenness that has traveled through your family line and in some ways it's stuck in you as well. And you're feeling like, you know what, I, I just want to do this by myself. But friends, if I could encourage you from the word of God and my story this morning, this is not a behavior that gets better when you're on your own. Would you reach out to a friend? Would you reach out to a pastor? Would you reach out for one of these groups to say, I need help. Would you show me the better way that God has? Because God's plan for every one of us is a good way. It is good, it is perfect, and it is pleasing. Let me pray for you this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of freedom, of hope, and of joy. And I pray that in all the places where we live stuck, where we're not experiencing your freedom, hope, and joy, that we would be able to come to you and to others to open up our lives in vulnerability and say, would you help me? God, I pray that this would be a safe place. And more importantly, even that we would know you are a safe God, that we can come in our brokenness, our sin and our shame, and we can lay it out and you love us and you heal us and your plans for us are good. And so God, in confidence of your good plans, may we pursue you and pursue the freedom you have for us. And may Petra Church continue to be a place known for hope, for healing, and for freedom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pure Desire Ministries. Thank you, Nick. We just appreciate you so much and your ministry. It's been uh, life-changing for our church and for our community. And so thank you for everything that you do. Would you stand with me this morning? 
I, I know as Americans, and especially as folks who live in Lancaster, we like options. That's why our buffets in the area are so successful. Uh, if you could just hear my heart on this, Petra Church is all in on this course. I'm asking all of you to at some point in your life go through this material. We're going to be doing it as a group here in the next few weeks. You can sign up for it. Whether you're struggling, we need you free. If you're struggling, we need you free. If you're not struggling, I need you to be trained to help those who are. Amen? I'm not throwing out any other options. We don't like that. We, you know, this, is, this is a super focused, passionate plea. This is a very focused vision statement right here. I need those of you who have experienced freedom to be trained to help those who haven't. And I need those of you who are not free to get free. Amen? Can you agree to that? I'm asking our church to go through this curriculum. I'm asking you to engage. Maybe you can't do it in this particular round. We're going to continuously offer this ministry uh, for many, many years to come. We already do. Uh, yesterday there was a training. We had 25 churches in the area. Petra is that church. We are that place where people are finding freedom. They're being trained and they're going out and they're making a difference. We want to continue to do that. Please find a way to get involved. Talk uh, with your spouse, talk with your parents, talk to whoever you need to, uh, to get involved with this ministry. There is a table in the atrium. You can access our registrations online. We encourage you to get involved. I believe that if God can set us free, if God can set us free, revival is around the corner, folks. If we, if we allow him to set us free, revival is around the corner, but we got to engage. we got to take that step. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for the fact that the Son of God comes and he shines his light on men. And, and you reveal all kinds of things when your, li when your light shines. You, you reveal the goodness in our hearts that comes from you, but you also reveal the areas of our, our lives that need your pruning and your cleansing. And God, you don't shine light on our sin to bring us shame, but you shine light on our sin to bring freedom and cleansing and wholeness. It reveals our need for you, and it's a need that we all have. There's no judgment in the house today. There's no judgment. We just rebuke shame in the name of Jesus. Why? Because we're becoming free together. That's who we are. We're not, we're not bound. We're not lost. We're not pathetic. We are becoming free. That's who we are. And Father, thank you for this curriculum. Thank you for this ministry. Thank you for your son, Jesus. It's through him that we find real freedom. And so, Father, cleanse this place. Let us be a beacon to this world that real freedom is a real thing in your son, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Go in peace. God bless you. We'll see you next week.